Okay, folks, I think we're uh, pretty much ready to get started. Um, go ahead and... Uh, all right, first off, I wanted... Uh, uh, we didn't do a Hacker Court last year, uh, but we did it uh, the year before, and uh, a couple years before that as well. So we're um, uh, kind of an evolving uh, cast of uh, characters here. I want to kind of run through everyone. Uh, and as I refer to you, wave your hand at the crowd or something so they know who you are. Uh, our judge tonight is uh, Richard Salgado. He's a, uh, he's a, 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 a former, uh, a former uh, DOJ employee. And uh, can I mention your current employer? OK, he currently works at Yahoo as their legal counsel. Discovered that you can go into the private sector and make 30, 40 times what you uh, used to make as <laughs> um, Our uh, court clerk is uh, Caitlin Klein, who holds the record as being the youngest uh, speaker ever at a black hat several years ago. She was in here at uh, eight years old. So uh, a distinct uh, uh, thing there. Uh, Playing uh, our uh, Samantha Jones, who's going to be a CISO of a, a company that'll become clear, is uh, uh, Carol Fenley, who's back there. And this is more or less Carol's baby, okay? She's the one that's kind of come up with this whole thing, and it's illegitimate, illegitimate baby, yes. But uh, nonetheless, a, a baby uh, for, for her. Uh, uh, next, we have uh, uh, Kevin Bankston over here. He's a uh, staff attorney, Electronic Frontier Foundation. Ironically, our uh, illustrious uh, EFF representative is going to be a prosecutor uh, this time, which should be, uh, should be kind of fun. Uh, next to him is our defense attorney, uh, Paul Ohm. And what's fun about Paul is he's being a defense attorney when he actually used to be DOJ and prosecute some of the scum that he'll be defending. So that's uh, got kind of nice. Uh, back for a return appearance as a defendant uh, is uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Brian Martin. Uh, he'll be representing SCOM tonight. Uh, we have uh, Brian Boulat, who is our reporter that breaks open this uh, illustrious thing. There's Ryan there. Um, where's Ovi? Ovi Carroll is uh, one of our, uh, uh, he's our uh, case agent and actually does his, uh, does his thing, uh, <laughs> kicks in the door and all that kind of, kind of stuff. He has lots of fun doing that. Uh, I'll be playing uh, uh, the uh, senator tonight. Uh, so that's why I'm dressed this way. And then, uh, and then uh, uh, John Klein is going to be our uh, expert witnesses over here, who's uh, <laughs> A lot of, uh, lot of uh, John Klein fans in the room. That's, uh, it's always good. Sad, really, but there you go. Uh, let's jump onto the next slide. Just to give you, uh, and we're going to try to move quickly through this. Uh, we're going to, uh, this is roughly the, uh, the order of uh, appearance that we're going to be adhering to. This is a double session, OK? Now, we will be taking a break, so you can run out the beginning of the gala and get liquored up and then run back in here. Now one thing we will ask is that if you're able to get two things to drink and bring us <laughs> one of them, that's even better. Or three, whatever it takes, okay? All right, we certainly would appreciate it since it will be uh, one of those uh, open bar things. So I think uh, that's uh, pretty much uh, it with the intro and let's go ahead and call things to get things going. All rise, Hacker Court is now in session. The Honorable Richard Salgado presiding. Thank you. <laughs> you may be seated. Uh, good afternoon, counsel. I see that the jury has been impaneled uh, and is now sitting. Uh, before we get more formally, let me just say that I want to thank the jury for taking the time to participate uh, in one of the most fundamental uh, 
ways that you can as a citizen to <clears throat> help support a rule of law in a society like ours. Uh, we have a long and illustrious history in this country of jury service, uh, and I want to express my gratitude to you for sitting here today. Uh, let me first explain how the trial is going to proceed generally. The, this is a criminal case. Uh, the United States government has brought charges against a defendant, and you're going to be hearing the case about those charges. The government, or I'll refer to them as prosecution at times, uh, is represented by a United States uh, assistant United States attorney, Kevin Bankston. He's representing the government in bringing the charges, and he will bear the burden of proof on the claims made against the defendant. The defendant here, Mr. Brian Martin, is being represented by an attorney, uh, Paul Ohm. And Mr. Ohm will be speaking on behalf of Mr. Martin, and should he choose to, will be providing a defense for his counsel, for his uh, uh, client. The indictment here charges that the defendant illegally intercepted electronic communications, otherwise known as wiretapping, and then using those communications and disclosing the communications to others, all in violation of United States federal law. The indictment is simply a document that lists the charges. It's nothing else. It's not evidence. It doesn't prove or disprove anything. It's just a listing of the charges. The defendant has pleaded not guilty to the charges listed in the indictment, and he is presumed to be innocent unless he's proven otherwise. And in fact, the jury, all 12 of you, must unanimously find that the government has proved his guilt beyond reasonable doubt before you can convict the defendant of any of the charges. The first step in this trial will be opening statements. Uh, the government opening statement will tell you about the evidence which it pretends, which it will uh, intend to put before you. And as I mentioned before, the indictment is not evidence. Well, the opening statements of the prosecutor is not also uh, in any way probative of what actually happened. They are purely descriptions of what's likely to be proved at trial or what the uh, prosecution intends to prove at trial, and nothing more than that. The defense counsel, after the uh, opening statement of the prosecution, will likewise have a, an obligation, or excuse me, an opportunity, but no obligation to present his opening statement. And again, just like the indictment and the prosecutor's opening statement, it's not evidence of anything. Uh, the evidence will come next after the opening statements, and those, uh, the evidence will be presented to you in a couple different forms. You will be hearing from witnesses through testimony. You'll be seeing documents, uh, and there may be other types of evidence that are brought to your attention. The attorneys will bring them in, and as they come in, you will be allowed to see it, and you will hear likely testimony about uh, the document exhibits. Once the government has presented its case, the defense will have an opportunity to present its evidence. The defense has no obligation to present any evidence, uh, but may choose to do so if it wishes. After you've heard the evidence on both sides, the government and the defense will each be given time to present final arguments, closing arguments. Once those are given, I will be uh, providing you with guidance, jury instructions as it's called, on how to uh, evaluate the facts and come to a conclusion. You will be bound to follow those instructions, although the duty of actually finding the facts is exclusively within your domain. Now, with that introduction of what the proceeding will look like, we'll now begin with opening statements. Mr. Bankston, would you like to proceed? Yes, thank you, Your Honor. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen of this uh, untraditionally large jury. <laughs> Unfortunately, many communications providers these days have the idea that if it's my network, I can do whatever I like with the communications that I transmit. But they're dead wrong. Federal law makes it a felony to intercept private communications without the consent of the parties to those communications. Uh, and that applies to communications providers just as it applies to the general public not counting some narrow exceptions for interceptions that are a necessary part of uh, maintaining and securing one's network. Put simply, no sysadmin is above the law. And if they're sniffing content, they better have a damn good reason. Now, pardon my French here, but the severity of this crime, the interception of a US senator's private communications, has my prosecutorial blood boiling a bit. 
Um, today, you'll hear the story of a sysadmin who broke the law, who, without the consent of any party, intercepted and used and disclosed, in, in violation of federal law, the private emails of his users, and in particular, some very revealing emails sent by one Senator Damon Gasm. You'll hear from Senator Gasm uh, that while attending a conference of his political allies, the Coalition for Moral Order, he sent two rather blue emails with compromising photographs to his young Senate staffer, Kimberly Lovelace. Neither he nor she ever disclosed those emails or photos to anyone else, and yet they appeared in the newspaper, the Washington Compost, uh, only a few days after being sent. Now, you'll hear testimony from O.V. Carroll, the special agent of the Office of Special Investigations, about his investigation into the leak of these photos, how, after several dead ends, he finally examined the network that the coalition sysadmin, the defendant, Brian Martin, had set up for the conference that Senator Gasm attended. You'll hear what he discovered in that system, a system to which only the defendant had administrative access. There he discovered sophisticated spying software that sniffed the, the content of all of the conference attendees' internet communications, uh, and in many cases, stored those communications, including the senators, based on a filter of the defendant's own design. You'll further hear how no one but the defendant had access to those communications. Finally, you'll hear from Ryan Bulet, Bulet uh, the reporter who published the story and about his previous relationship with the defendant. Again, the only person uh, known to have access to Senator Gasm's emails and pictures uh, other than the lovely Miss Lovelace. Um, uh, these are photos of a man, uh, Senator Gasm, that the defendant once held in high esteem for his moral purity, um, but has now been disillusioned by the horrifying photographic evidence that you will soon see. Uh, taken together, this evidence paints a simple picture that the defendant unjustifiably invaded the privacy of his users without their knowledge or their consent, and in particular intercepted Senator Gasm's emails. Then, enraged by the senator's moral failings, as demonstrated by these aforementioned horrific photos, um, used them to embarrass the senator and unmask his hypocrisy by leaking them to his friend at the Washington Compost. Um, in sum, this is one sysadmin who considered himself above the law, rifling through the private communications of his users for his own devious purposes. In doing so, he has, as the evidence will show, violated federal law by intercepting, using, and disclosing Senator Gasm's personal emails. Thank you. Mr. Rome, do you have an opening statement? I do, Your Honor. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. As you probably have already gathered from that recitation, this is not your ordinary case. This is an odd case. It's an odd case with some odd people in it. Why are we here today? We are here today because an admittedly very powerful man, Senator Gasm, did something that was very embarrassing. Did something that brought, perhaps you could even say, some shame upon him, some notoriety. I'm sure many of you in the jury have heard about these facts before today. This is a powerful man who deeply embarrassed helped move the lumbering, slow machinery of the United States government to find a scapegoat, and a scapegoat they found. And that person 